This is Open Mind. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Glad you're with us tonight. We have a very interesting conversation. We're talking with somebody who has been in the news a lot. He is a well-known, sometimes controversial, civil rights activist. Uh, it's Justin Jones. Uh, Justin Jones, thank you for being here in thank person. You. Yes. <laughs> um, now, certainly been in the news. You've been part of many of the demonstrations, many of the protests that we've seen over the last year, two years here. You've been arrested a few times. I want to talk about all that, but we have some time here. And I also want to talk about, I mean, I look at your biography. You're 25 years old. It also says you're a Vanderbilt Divinity student. So how, what got you started? How, how did you go from being a Vanderbilt Divinity student to controversial, well-known yeah, uh, activist. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, thank you so much again for having me, Ben. It's good to be back and in person. Um, and I think the story starts um, at another institution not too far from Vanderbilt Fisk University. Um, that's where I did my undergraduate. It's a school that has a legacy of civil rights activism with people like John Lewis, Diane Nash, Bernard Lafayette, Miriam Berry. And I don't think you can go to Fisk without um, being somehow engaged in the movement. It's, it's kind of expected of us. And so that was kind of my journey. And for me, um, as someone who's, I'm on leave from Divinity School, but as someone who sees faith as inseparable from justice, I see faith and justice as combined. I see people like James Lawson, another Vanderbilt, controversial Vanderbilt Divinity you know, alumni who was kicked out of Vanderbilt Divinity School um, for his civil rights activism and see these type of elders as role models, see them as people who remind us that the struggle's not over. In fact, James Lawson was just here, you know, for the memorial for John Lewis that we changed the street name not too far from here and talked about how the movement must continue against what he calls plantation capitalism and racism. Um, and also he called out the governor while he was here, so, <laughs> yeah. What would you say your first big demonstration was? You, you it's one thing to go, it's another thing to kind of lead and become the face of them. Your first big demonstration was what? Yeah, um, I remember it very much. It was when Trayvon Martin was killed. He was 17 years old, I was 17 years old in high school, and, and that was one of the first rallies I organized when I was in high school, growing up in the Bay Area, before you know, I came to Fisk University. And I just remember when that verdict came out to say that um, George Zimmerman would not be convicted of murdering Trayvon. J just the inhumanity, the, the emotion that I saw of elders crying, of young people screaming out, like this is something that was deep and ancestral, you know, when you look at um, the struggle for black humanity in this nation. And so I just, that was a moment, that was a turning point for me um, that I, I kind of committed myself to the movement. And um, I made a last minute decision to come to Fisk, wasn't planning to come to Fisk, and saw that this was a school where I could do social justice and be involved in the, you know, academics. And, in fact, got the John Lewis Scholarship for Social Activism, which helped me to be able to stay in school and afford school. And that was really a turning point for me. And then from there, I remember when I first came to college, my family said, Justin, um, don't get involved in your protests, you know, because it's very different from the Bay Area. And I listened to them for about my first semester and then saw that this was a place that, um, you know, we really, there's a lot of work to do and that I wanted to be a part of that. And that if we want to change a nation, a lot of that work has to happen in the South. Trayvon Martin, that, and you're talking about Tampa Bay, is that right? When you say San, Bay Area, what, what area? Oh, no, I'm from Bay Area, Oakland. Oakland, Oakland so, Bay San Francisco. Yeah, Bay. Okay. yeah. So the Bay Area. So you come here, um, yeah. and Trayvon Martin. So that was, that was the thing that kind of got you into yeah. this when you were 17. And, and also my grandparents. So I, I want to say, too, is that some, my, my great-grandmother's family comes from Tennessee and left Tennessee because of the terrorism of Jim Crow, moved to the south side of Chicago, then moved to the Bay Area. So it's kind of like a full circle coming back to the south, coming back to Nashville. Um, my family was from Memphis. My, you know, my ancestors are from Memphis and then coming back to the state where they left seeking for a better opportunity and saying, I'm coming back here to make a better opportunity and to, to make a more just society here in the state. <laughs> the thing I remember um, you first being in the news for was Nathan Bedford Forrest. Mm -hmm. What was the first demonstration protest that you remember here in Tennessee getting involved in? Yeah, that was actually, even before Nathan Bedford Forrest, it was about student IDs. So this was when, in 2013, 2014, started organizing at Fisk and with HBCU students challenging Tennessee um, restrictive voter ID law what we're seeing across the nation now um, talked about but Tennessee passed theirs back in 2013 that made it so we could not use our college IDs to vote 
but you could use a gun permit to vote. And so we were challenging voter suppression, something that's very familiar now nationwide, but in Tennessee it was kind of like a laboratory where they start testing these voter suppression laws. Um, I, was, I was one of the plaintiffs in a federal lawsuit against that, um, where we sued the state of Tennessee, Secretary Hargett, over that law. And that was the first um, issue that I was involved in, and then from there kind of transitioned to healthcare work, looking at Medicaid expansion. And then in 2015, after the um, Charleston massacre, is when we started protesting, when I led a, my first protest against the Nathan Bedford Forrest bus in 2015, when we saw this national reckoning around Confederate monuments, starting in South Carolina at the State House, and then looking at our own State House, having a monument to the KKK within, you know, within the hall that's no longer there because of activism and because of pressure. Um, and so it's kind of been a long journey. <laughs> Now you face some criminal charges, mm -hmm. so you've been charged criminally. Many of them have been dropped. Um, I, I don't think all of them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk more about that. But my question, what is your philosophy when it comes to protesting? Mm -hmm. Do you push the envelope? Mm -hmm. Does the envelope need to be pushed? Um, but yeah, what, what, what is your philosophy and what, so why do you think you have all of these criminal charges that have been filed against you? Yeah. First I'll start by saying that I think Nashville has a history of charging young folks so who are engaged in civil rights with protests. If you look in our Nashville library, there's mugshots of people like John Lewis and C.T. Vivian and Bernard Lafayette and Diane Nash for doing civil rights activism that was controversial and that was deemed extreme, challenging segregation. And so for me, um, I don't think that there's such a thing as a comfortable protest. I think that if, that is, if it's comfortable, it's not a protest um, because even looking at it from my perspective, protest is always one of the last results. A lot of people don't realize this, and I think, you know, I kind of talked to you about this. There's this caricature of me wanting, and, and a lot of us just wanting to go down and, and protest and to be out there. They don't see the behind the scenes work of meetings, you know, trying to, um, when Beth Harwell was speaker, we would, we would be able to meet with her and talk with her. So we didn't really have as many protests because we were dealing with reasonable people. Um, I've met with Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally a few times, you know, and so these are people who are willing to meet with us. But then if people are not willing to meet, if they're not willing to talk and say, these are some things that we can do to improve our state, or these are some things that we want to offer to you as alternatives to the, the current system, then you have no choice but to protest. Like Governor Lee refused to meet with us for 62 days last summer. Instead, we had over 200 arrests. I have 14 charges from that last summer. 12 of them have been dropped. One of them was dropped by a judge last week um, based off of some false evidence. And so I think that um, no one, I don't, I, I can speak for myself. I don't go into this saying I want to be arrested. I, I want to be brutalized and threatened because that's what comes with protests. I don't think people see the death threats that we receive. I don't think people see the trauma that comes of that. I don't think people see the physical harm and emotional harm that comes from protesting. But protesting is saying to the politics of wrong that you cannot operate in the comfort of silence. And I think that's really what protesting is about. And so are you happy with um, what's happened with Nathan Bedford Forrest? What, what, what is your reaction to the fact that just, this, um, just recently here has been now moved to the, the State Museum? Mm -hmm. I think the first word, as I, as I said on Friday, um, when they had that vote, the word that came to mind, excuse me, on Thursday, the word that came to mind was finally. Finally, Tennessee is re recognizing that this monument to white supremacy, this monument to treason, this monument to terrorism, does not represent who we want to be as a state. And yet the sad part is, is that it took over four decades to remove this monument. It was put up in 1978. And the sad part I say is, that this was the easy part, removing the symbols of white supremacy, removing the monuments of white supremacy. Now we must continue and say, let's remove all the policies and practices that the statue represents. Because we know that Nathan Bedford Forrest, the symbol being gone does not mean that what he fought for is, is gone. We have movements to take away black votes. We have movements to reincarcerate black bodies. We have movements to deny living wages and deny health care to people because they see them as unworthy of, human, of humanness. And these are all things that Nathan Bedford Forrest fought for when he fought to uphold slavery and when he fought to uphold white supremacy. Um, and so these are just some things that I think the continued struggle we're called to engage in. Some of the reaction, not everybody obviously agreed that it, it should be removed. Um, there's a comment here from Lieutenant Governor McNally. The left-wing activists who are pushing an anti-American, anti-history agenda here in Tennessee and across the nation will not stop with Nathan Bedford Forrest. The woke mob means ultimately to uproot and discard not just Southern symbols, but American history, American heroes, and history as well. <laughs> what do you think of that? I think it's ironic that the same lieutenant governor and same lawmakers who passed a law to ban the teaching of history 
when it comes to systemic racism are now saying that we're trying to remove history. When they passed a law banning critical race theory, banning sc school children from learning about people like Ruby Bridges who desegregated her school, we have a movement in the state to get rid of history. And yet when we're saying we want to remove symbols of white supremacy, not all around, but from our state capital in particular, the place where we pass laws are saying, you want to get rid of our history. And as I told people, um, Randy McNally, our dear brother, um, does not see that what we're doing is for his grandchildren too. We want them to live in a state where all children feel welcome in the capital, where they don't come to a capital and say, here's a man who wanted some of my friends or some people who I know to be dehumanized and be treated as separate and unequal. And so I think Randy McNally, just like a lot of um, folks, because Governor Lee once supported this monument until pressure showed him another side. I think Randy McNally, rather on this side of eternity or the other, will see that this was wrong. And to see that, just like Nathan Bedford Forrest, that what the cause that he's trying to uphold is wrong and that does not deserve a memorial in the, in the most important building in our state, which is the state capitol. And so there was the move to remove Nathan Bedford Forrest, but he's saying it won't stop there, mm -hmm. that um, it's, there's going to be more, mm -hmm. and calls it the woke mob. Mm -hmm. What is next? I mean, yeah. is, is, is there more that you want to do? What, what is next? Yeah. The first thing I just sorry, I'm having these images of George Wallace and people like that in my head where they said it won't stop with voting rights. You know, these, these blacks, these, you know, they call it something else, wants more. They want to take over socialism. So that's what I hear when I hear that. It makes me laugh because, again, George Wallace had to apologize at the end of his life when he was on his deathbed. He changed. Um, and so I just hope that Brother McNally, um, I, I met with him. I do have love for him and, and I want us to live in a Tennessee where we can reconcile and have a better future. I hope that one day we can sit down and talk again and, and, and say, what is next? Let's determine that together. What is next for me is a multiracial democracy. What is next for me is a Tennessee in which we have symbols of real heroes. People like Ida B. Wells and Diane Nash. People like Governor um, Brown, you know, Brownslow, who was uh, the governor during Reconstruction. Um, we, we have real heroes to honor in the South. The Clinton Nine, who desegregated their school in Clinton, Tennessee. Alex Haley, you know, Elvis, you, you know, whoever you want to name, Dolly Parton. I mean, we have real heroes to honor here. And so let's, let's determine what's next together. I, I've invited the governor, I've invited Lieutenant McNally, I've invited Speaker Cameron Sexton. Always we want to engage in conversation because I believe that the future of Tennessee, we have to determine together. Today, just today, I was in Moore County on a cattle farm talking to some friends, learning about cattle farming and also talking about what is our vision of Tennessee. You know, we were talking to some friends there. Um, that's why I'm wearing these jeans. You know, I got a you know, nice shirt, but I had to change my shirt. I didn't change my pants because I believe that we have to get outside of Nashville. We have to go to rural counties and talk to people and let them know that these caricatures that they create of us of being against each other, being a black extremist against some rural racist person is not true. Is that I think we all want a future in Tennessee where we have things that our children don't have to struggle. They can live easier lives than we live. I think all of us want that regardless of party. And I think that it's become politicized and racialized because it maintains the status quo and those who have an interest in maintaining the system also have an interest of keeping us divided so that they can you know, keep us separate. But I'm, my goal and my thing is I'm going across the state and I want to talk to people about how the same people who have tricked people to saying I'm fighting for you by fighting for these Confederate monuments are actually the same people fighting against them having health care, fighting against rural hospitals, you know, having adequate funding, or fighting against fair um, funding of our schools, or fighting against voting rights, or fighting against clean water. Like these are the same people protecting Confederate monuments and making this game of, of us versus them when really there's more of us in terms of this multiracial democracy than those in power. So you're traveling across a very red state. Mm -hmm. How are you being received? I mean, that, that, that's quite a message. I mean, how is that message being received when, when, when you travel across? Are you optimistic that we can really get past some of this or what are you meeting? Yeah, I mean, even in this short journey, um, I mean, the past month, you know, or two months, I, was, I was, you know, went to Giles County, was able to talk to folks. Was, we were in Moore County with some friends today and, um, and I think I think people are looking for hope. I think people are looking for something beyond the madness that we're facing. And I think the truth is that if you look at Tennessee, for example, 70% of Tennesseans, regardless of party, support things like Medicaid expansion. They support, you know, living wages. Like, I think it's, it's been distorted the narrative. And I think the more you talk to people, like whether you stop in a gas station on your way from somewhere, you talk to people and see, you know, people struggling, you know, even, with salaries and things like that and you see people really wanting something better. I don't think anybody want, no one, I don't think there's one person in this state who says I want to keep things exactly the way they are all, exactly how they are right now. Like, I think we want something and I think this pandemic situation has forced us to have to reckon with some of these things. It's really stopped our lives and forced us to pause and reflect on what is it that will be 
contributing, you know, that will contribute to thriving and not just surviving in the state. And so I think, um, I think the majority of Tennesseans want something different. Uh, and I think that we have to go to places that are uncomfortable. Like I, I think that we have to get outside of the, the quote unquote liberal circles of just Nashville and Shelby County and, you know, and where we are comfortable and where maybe people mostly agree with us and go to places where the other 90 counties that are rural and say, we have more in common than they've tricked us to believe. And that we want to also hear what are your what is your vision? What is your hope? What do you want for your grandchildren? I think that's the most important question is that when we look at what we're fighting for, look at the next generations and not just us right now. Because I think us right now, it's very easy to get caught in self-interest and get caught in this type of self way of thinking. But if we think about children and grandchildren and, and, and the legacy we want to live, I think we all it softens hearts, I really believe. I think it softens hearts because I think that there's a humanizing effect when we think about that and we think about also our legacy and our fragility as humans that we don't have a lot of time on this earth. You know, we both have birthdays, we, you know, here. And so, like, time is, is finite. And I think that's what I told the Senate committee a few months ago when I testified about this run over protester bill. I said, Senator Rose, do you want your granddaughter to come in here and tell her that I spent my last few days in the legislature trying to pass a law to make it so you can run over protesters. Is that really you want to tell your family? Because I think that's something that none of us would be proud of. And so we have to tell the truth. <laughs> so when you go and speak, um, whether it be at the legislature or in Giles County or wherever, one thing people might say is, well, here, here is somebody who's certainly well known, all of those things, but he's been arrested all of these times. Mm -hmm. What do you say if there's somebody who says, boy, he's been arrested all of these times, that's problematic. I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, uh, what, what about yeah. the arrests? Yes. And, and is that problematic to what you're trying to do? Yes, I think it's a good question. And I say good trouble. I say good trouble. I think getting arrested is not something that's fun. It's not something that I'm like, I want to get arrested. But I think it's something that if we look through our history books, whether it was women's suffragettes, whether it was the labor movement, Cesar Chavez, whether it was Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, the people in Nashville who we honor, who we have street names after. We have Rosa Parks Boulevard, MLK Boulevard, John Lewis Boulevard, all people who were arrested. Interesting. And so I say that, um, and I think a lot of us also believe this, the real criminals are those who have not been arrested. It's those who are passing laws to enrich themselves. And, and, and to harm others. The real criminals are those who are letting people die and denying them health care. And so I think that we have to change this definition of criminality um, because if we want to also look at who's being investigated by the FBI, it's not me, but there's some lawmakers who are not too far from here who are under FBI investigations who want to talk about criminality. But I think for me, um, getting arrested is something that, um, I'll tell you a story. When I took my mugshot, I remember the guards kept getting upset because I was smiling. I smiled at my mugshot and they said, why are you smiling? This is not a, a joyous experience. I said, I'm going to show this picture to my children and let them know that every time I was in this jail, this past summer, not 14 charges, so you know, 14 times, I was thinking about them. I did this for them and I was willing to put my body on the line for them and for even the troopers who arrested me for their children. As I told this trooper who was in court, I forgive you for lying on me. The case was dismissed because he lied and brought false evidence, but I forgive him because at the end of the day, it's for his children too. And I will never back down from that. It's, it is rooted in love. It is rooted in beloved community. It is rooted in the sense of justice that says you can you know, incarcerate our body, but you cannot incarcerate our spirit of what we know is going to be the reality of this world. And that is a world that is at peace with us. So that is a world in which we can live outside of this racism and this economic injustice and this plantation capitalism, but one in which we can live, and, and, and there'll still be issues always, but we can live beyond this and we can kind of, you know, when, by the time I get you know, a little older, can pass the baton to this next generation and say, we did the best we could. We did the best we could with what, with what we had. And I've always thought about that. Um, being 25 now, I've been thinking about things a lot more. I'm not that old, but you know, seeing, I, I graduated college a few years ago and seeing that now it's time to also encourage other students to step up because I'm kind of getting out of the realm of student activists. You know? I only have a few more years until I graduate. And so it's time for a new generation of student activists to pick up the mantle and say, um, it's our time now. <laughs> you said protests are designed to be, I guess, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, if you, as you look back now as an um, elderly 25-year-old, <laughs> do you ever feel like you went too far? Is there something you regret or not far enough? Or, you know, as you look back, whether it be you know, in, in, in any of these that are, that are meant to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. as you say, did, did you go too far or, or you don't feel that way? No, I think I, think I would ask, you know, 
like you asked, was it too extreme? Was it too radical? And I would say, you know, is not racism extreme and radical? Is not police brutality extreme and radical? Is not economic injustice and Medicaid denying people health care extreme and, and, and radical? And so I would say that I think we did the best we could with what we had. And that I'm someone who, who does have the humility to say that I'm always learning. And that's why I'm, I do consult people like Diane Nash and talk to James Lawson when he was in town about what is, what is nonviolence? What is, you know, I, I mean, I always have had this commitment to nonviolence, but I want to even expand that definition because I think as I talk to them, I realize that even um, in the media and our dominant narrative, we have a misconception of nonviolence as being passive. Where nonviolence is direct, it is soul force, it is, it is confrontational. Um, because if I love you, I want to make you conscious of things you cannot see, as James Baldwin said. So I want you to see that there's harm happening. And so I think um, I just want to, I've, I've expanded my conceptualization of nonviolence to see also that um, we have violence happening every day in the legislature that we don't call violence, we call it politics. But if you look at it and the harm it creates, it is institutional violence. And so the thing that I'm learning is just to expand definitions, to expand ways to engage with people. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing to travel Tennessee to have conversations because I want to learn, um, you know, today it was about learning, you know, about cow farming and I want to learn like what is life like for our people here so that even when we say you know the people of Tennessee it's not just one perspective but it's something that transcends geographic boundaries race rural versus urban like we really want to have a full conceptualization of Tennessee and it's really exciting to me to see that no matter where you travel in the state as I said people want a better life for their children and grandchildren and that we have more in common than you would guess we all you know a lot of us love sweet tea a lot of us you know we, we want <laughs> we want it we want the news drives us crazy you know when people see the news that not everyone wants to just be depressed all the time they want to hear stories that give them hope and I think um, there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity to increase hope in this state. All right, fascinating. We have to we have to take a break. I could I could ask a million more questions. Right. We have plenty of time. Yeah. But also, if you want to call in, there's the number 615-737 plus 615-737-7587. We'll continue our discussion. I want to ask what's coming up next. Um, all kinds of stuff. But we'll take a break. We'll be back right after this.